consumption was that we might be able to see its parallel in certain religious systems. Um, <clears throat> by the way, um, bind together this religion, to bind people together, to find a way to bring them together. So, community, kinship, all of these words. So, similar to that. Right? So you have to have a boundary. So it needs a boundary. And once you create a boundary, necessarily, you have to always have an opposition to it to the people outside of the boundary. And therefore there's always going to be a tension for every religio. Democrats, Republican, any. Here, is there a source for this? I've only seen this one other time, and I'm a little surprised. You only saw this once at a time? No, this idea about religio and to bind back. Okay. Is well, there a source for this? It's twice then. That's nearly an eternal truth. <laughs> Three times? No, no, no. No, no, no. no. Uh, I would say the thing to do is to always look up Skeet's etymological dictionary. We can do it on the web too. Skeet's. Ah, I, I, I forget how to spell it. It's S E A T S. Two E's? No, A. S K E A T S. Anyhow, Skeet's etymological dictionary. Is that funny? You're recommending a book on a dictionary and you're not sure how to spell it. Anyhow, it's a nice book. War. Barbara, you know that? that yeah, I think it comes, like if you think of the word uh, ligation or any of those words, ligature, you get that sense of uh, binding. Yeah, I know, but the other author that I know used this exact analogy. So I think that's where you, if, I think the Latin goes to bind back. Yes. Or to bind again. Right. right. To bind again. Yeah. Okay. We have a little fun. So we need a couple of reasons. Gina said yes, and who else? One. Nancy, you want? You want to use my lobe? I'll read. Okay, you're up. Pardon me. Did you want to? Well, I. I oh, yeah. You, you, can, see, so. okay, you can use this one. Uh, okay. Well, you know. Sure. Okay. 301. 301 or 157C or BC. Or. Must we not consider what is likely to happen to the other things if the one exists? We must. 301. 
Okay. We must. Are you ready? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Shall we tell then what must happen to the things other than one if one exists? Let us do so. Well, since they are other than the one, the other things are not the one. For if they were, they would not be other than the one. True. And yet, surely, the others are not altogether deprived of the one, but they partake of it in a certain way. In what way? As soon as they give you the sneeze, I'll tell you. <laughs> because the others are other than the one by reason of having parts. For if they had no parts, they would be altogether one. True. But parts, we affirm, belong to that which is a whole. Yes, we affirm that they do. But the whole must be one composed of many, and of this the parts are parts. For each of the parts must be a part. Another of many, but of a whole. How is that? If anything is a part of many, and is itself one of the many, it will be a part of itself, which is impossible. And each, and of each one of the others, if it is a part of all. For, if it is not a part of some particular one, it will be a part of the rest, with the exception of that one, and thus it will not be a part of each one, and not being a part of each one, it will not be a part of any one of the many, but that which belongs to none cannot belong, whether as a part or as anything else, to all those things to none of which it belongs. That is clear. Then the part is a part not of the many, nor of all, but of a single form and a single concept, which we call a whole, a perfect unity, created out of all. This it is of which the part is the part. Hmm. Yeah, certainly. If then the others have parts, they will partake of the whole of the one. True. Then the things which are other than one must be a perfect whole which has parts. Yes, they must. And the same reasoning applies to each part for the part must partake of the one. For if each of the parts is a part of, is a part, the word each implies that it is one, separated from the rest and existing by itself. Otherwise, it will not be each. True. But its participation in the one clearly implies that it is other than the one, for if not, it would not partake of the one, but would actually be one. But really, it is impossible for anything except one itself to be one. Mm. Yes, it is impossible. And both the whole and the part must necessarily participate in the one, for the one will be a whole of which the parts are parts, and again, each individual one which is a part of the whole, will be a part of the whole. The part of the whole will be part of the whole. Part of the whole. Part of the whole. Which is a part of a whole, will be a part of the whole. Of the whole. Yes. 
and will not the things which participate in the one be other than the one while participating in it? Of course. But the things which are other than the one will be many. For if they were neither one nor more than one, they would not be anything. No. But since the things which participate in the one as a part and the one as a whole are more than one, must not those participants in the one be infinite in number? Hmm. How so? Let us look at the question in this way. Is it not true that at the moment when they begin to participate in the one, they are not one and do not participate in one? Mm, clearly. Then they are multitudes in which the one is not, are they not? Yes, they are multitudes. Well then, if we should subtract from them in thought the smallest possible quantity, must not that which is subtracted, if it has no participation in one, be also a multitude and not one? It must. And always when we consider the nature of the class which makes it other than one, whatever we see of it at any time will be unlimited in number, will it not? Certainly. And further, when each part becomes a part, straightway the parts are limited in relation to each other and to the whole, and the whole in relation to the parts. Undoubtedly. The result then, to the things which are other than one is, that from the one and the union of themselves with it, there arises, as it, as it appears, something different within themselves which gives them a limitation in relation to one another. But their own nature, when they are left to themselves, gives them no limits. Hmm. So it appears. Then the things which are other than one, both as wholes and as parts, are both unlimited and partake of limitation. Certainly. And are they also both like and unlike one another and themselves? How is that? Inasmuch as they are all by their own nature unlimited, they are all in that respect affected in the same way. Mm, certainly. And surely, inasmuch as they all partake of limitation, they are all affected in the same way in that respect also. Obviously. And inasmuch as they are so affected as to be both limited and limitless, they are affected by affections which are the opposites of one another. Yes. But the opposites are as unlike as possible. To be sure. Then with regard to either one of their two affections, they are like themselves and each other. But with regard to both of them together, they are utterly opposed and unlike. Mm, yes, that must be true. Therefore, the others are both like and unlike themselves and one another. So they are. And they are the same as one another and also other than one another. They are both in motion and at rest, and since we have proved these cases, we can easily show that the things which are other than one experience all the opposite affections. You are right. Then... What if we now drop these matters as evident and again consider whether in hypothesis. That's a new hypothesis. Okay. okay. Um, 
Find anything interesting in this rather curious hypothesis? Yeah, I just have one small question right now. Um, does this represent what we have here? Um, the reason I'm wondering about it is, does he talk about what happens when there's a transition from the many into the whole? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be interested in knowing what he says about that. Because uh, I think we might be able to find something important. But oh, that's a transition, isn't it? Right. Mm -hmm. So we went back to 158B. Let us look at the question in this way, 305. Hmm. Is it not true that at the moment when they begin to participate in the one, they're not one, and they do not participate in one? See, look at, see. Out of the many, right, there's going to be a hunk. And like the riddle of time, Which way does time proceed, by the way? Does it come out of the future or out of the past? Does it come out of the past? I have no idea. No, okay. It comes out of the future? Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll make it clear. Thank you. Oh! <laughs> Wait. The question's clear anyway. Yes. But he's got the, this problem, see? What happens when something is coming? into this, see, when it begins. So part is, right? Now this is indistinct, because it's a manyness. Right? Once at that moment, when it just begins, is it not true that at the moment when they begin to participate in the one, they're not one, and they do not participate in the one? Well, then what are they then? Clearly, then they are multiples in which the one is not. Are they not? Yes. Right? So we have the multitudes, don't we? The many. Mm -hmm. right? and we have the one, and each one of these is a one. And now we're looking at the transition, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Well then, if we should subtract from them the smallest possible quantity must, not that which is subtracted, if it has no participation in one, be also a multitude and not one? Must. And always, when we consider the nature of the class, which makes it other than one, whatever we see of it at any time will be unlimited number, will it not? Mm -hmm. 
I'm limited to the moment. Unlimited mass. And always, when we consider the nature of the class which makes it other than one, whatever we see of it at any time will be unlimited number. Right. Now, here's the fun. Right. And further, when each part becomes a part, see, beginning, now it becomes a part, straightway the parts are limited in relation to each other and to the whole, and the whole in relation to the parts. Hey, then each one of these, each one of these has to become a part, right, is separate. Right? Each part separates from the rest, existing by itself. Really. More than that, when each part becomes a part, Straightway, the parts are limited in relation to each other and to the whole. Oh. 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 One fifty eight. Something like D. One fifty eight D. And the whole in relation to the parts, undoubtedly. The result then to the things which are other than one is that from the one and the union of themselves with it, there comes now, there arises, there arises as it appears, something different within themselves. Right? There's something different different from themselves. Wow. See? The result then of the things which are other than one is that from the one and the union of themselves with it there arises that appear something different within themselves and which gives them a limitation in relation to one another. themselves, when they're left to themselves, gives them no limits. to themselves, they, they go back into that sense of being unlimited, right? There's no limit. Right. So it appears. Huh. And then the things which are the one, both as holes and parts are both unlimited and will take a limitation.
They're limited by becoming part now of a whole. And therefore this little guy here now can become another one. And something happens to them. Right? Yes. Whatever it is. Right. Gosh, something happens to them. Something different happens from themselves and gives them a limitation in relation to one another too, see. So each of these, they're both a stranger as it is to one another, yet by being part of this unity, they have a, a limitation in one way, and yet when left by themselves, they go back to that sense of being unlimited without a limit. But something happens to them by participating in this. From themselves. Right? Something happens to themselves. Huh. The result then to the things which are other than one is that from the one and the union of themselves with it there arises as it appears something different within themselves. From, right? Okay, see? From the one, from the one, and the union of themselves, right? Now they gain a union. Right? They gain a union. There arises in that union something different within themselves. Why right? something different? Something different in themselves. They're transformed, something different from themselves, which gives them a limitation in relation to one another. Right? Gives them a limitation. So there I am. I'm. I now participate in this. I now have a sense of union with myself or many, depending upon how many are in the picture. Right. And something happens inside, something different from themselves. Something happens. And that gives them a limitation because they now joined the group, the right. whole. The religion. That's a limitation. And by remaining a part, each one of these is a part and they have to be distinctive and different from one another. But curiously enough, by joining this from the one, there's a union of themselves with the one, and from that something different within themselves arises, which gives them a limitation. They become a member of the whole, right? Bang. Right. Something different happens to them. Oh, uh, but you know what? Their own nature, you know, when they're left to themselves, you know. They realize uh, that ain't real. Um, they're really without them. Mm hmm. That's only when they're left by themselves. Hmm. So, what's the principle? Don't be left by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> stay with the mob. Stay, stay with the group. Stay with that union. So you fully realize, necessarily, that these are the properties that follow. Yeah. 
Oh, we're only talking about fourth hypothesis that doesn't apply to anything, does it? Sure sounds like it does. What? Yeah. What? Well, it sounds like the definition you gave of religion in the beginning. In what way? Well, that there's a bound, you know, a boundedness, that um, that there is that sense of being one of the group, one of the religion, and that exclu- you know, that's that there's those that are in and those that are out, and it also began to sound to me like um, Christianity, you know, because there's that experience of what they say is an experience of. Uh, taking Jesus into your heart and all that and becoming one of the group. Although there isn't that a real experience, but that's part of their mythos, right? But if they're ever left by themselves. And if they're ever le- yeah. yeah. Sin, sin, the snake, the snake. <laughs> yeah, they're, it's so, interesting. So they do everything together. You know, they have church this and church that. Islamic. 13th Street. Any, any... Any religion like that, of that nature. Amen. binds them together, so binds them Oh, and distinguishes them. Right, right. Puts a limit upon them. Mm-hmm. Right. But they go through a transformation within themselves, right? Something different from themselves, right? Really amazing. Mm-hmm. And that gives them a limitation? A lot of limitations, <laughs> depending upon which one you choose. But interesting, you see, it also gives them a limitation also, in each person is limited. Mm-hmm. Mm. They have to remain individuals. Mm. So simultaneously, they have that experience of isolation as well as unity. Mm. And when they're left alone, they drop the unity and the wholeness, and they recognize the matter of fact. What happens in Good. Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> oh, I just said what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Now, wait a minute. See, now we got an issue. In the fourth hypothesis, that means therefore that's only this is only true for those that join the group, or is that a property which you can say fits the whole? Hmm. Okay. Does that what we're talking about fit the whole thing? Hmm. And that's why he has another paragraph. Thank goodness. <laughs> Try it. Let go of it. See? Hey, uh, and are they uh, also both like and unlike one another and themselves? It's all of them. Too, the like and unlike mm. themselves. Inasmuch as they are all by their own nature unlimited, see, by their own nature hmm. they belong here. Hmm. In the multitude. Hmm. By their own nature. Hmm. They're left alone. So that's like if, if it wasn't for my, our blessed Lord Jesus, I would be a terrible sinner, and so, because I'm so unlimited. Then, you know what, then they are all, in that respect, affected in the same way. Ah, hmm. that applies to it all. Oh. And surely, inasmuch as they all partake of limitation, since they're all members of a whole, they're all affected in the same way, in that respect also. Yep. And inasmuch as they are so affected as to be both limited and limitless, they are affected by affections which are the opposites of one another. Oh. Hey, what does that mean? Hmm. They all experience the same sense of being limited and yet limitless. Therefore, they have a curious built-in contradiction of containing within themselves opposites. Mm-hmm. Right. Hey, I'm limited. So remember the whole. Yet, left by myself, I know that I am unlimited, therefore I'm affected by both opposites. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. But opposites 
opposites are as unlike as possible. To be sure, then regard, then with regard to either one of their two affections, they're both like themselves and uh, each other, but with regard to both of them together, they're utterly opposed and unlike. So, huh. They're both like and unlike. Because fundamentally, within themselves, they contain both. Hmm. And therefore, they're affected in the same way by each, and therefore, necessarily, they're both like and unlike. Hmm. And in the same way, the same as one another and other than one, and so he goes to a conclusion. Huh? Now, we go back to where we started. We find this uh, interesting proposition. Mm -hmm. And is he able to get the dynamics of any group that's bound together, that sees themselves as a member of a tribe, a group? Yes. And just a few words, a couple of sentences, and mm -hmm. letters of the Hmm. Therefore, what do we want to see? We want to see whether or not it is, whether or not we can lay the case that the argument against it, its opposite, right? It's denial, I should say. It's a. So therefore, we can now move to Proposition A, can we not? Let's see whether we're familiar with the language, we see how it's going on, and now let's see how he does it, shall we? Okay. Eight is at uh, three twenty-five or one sixty-four. B five. Uh, one sixty-four B. Just to go back, remember the one point that was important. What is the importance of the idea of the one for those that move from the many into the whole? They have to go all of those transformations. Okay. Right. So therefore, he's saying, well, what would follow if there is no one? Mm. We deny that. Mm. Let us see what follows. Mm -hmm. Let us then discuss further what happens to the other things if the one does not exist. Okay, shall we get our readers back? To eight? Yes. Okay. You first, 325. Let us then discuss further what happens to the other things if the one does not exist. What is useful? Well, they must exist. For if others do not even exist, there could be no talking about others. True. But if we talk about the others, the others are different. Or do you not agree to regard the words other and different as synonymous? Yes, I do. And we say that the different is different from the different, and the other is other than the other. Yes. Then if the others are to be others, there must be something of which they will be other. Yes, there must be. Now, what can that be? For they can, oh, is that true? No, no, no. For they cannot be other, others of the one, 
if it, if it does not exist, no. then they are others of each other. For they have no alternative except to be others of nothing. True. <coughs> they are each then others of each other in this group. For they cannot be so one at a time if one does not exist. I'm clever. Yeah. But each mass of them is unlimited <coughs> in number. And even if you take what seems to be the smallest bit, it suddenly changes like something in a dream. That which seemed to be one is seen to be many. And instead of very small, it seems to be very great in comparison with the minute fractions of it. Well, yeah. Very true. Such masses of others would be others of each other if others exist <laughs> and one does not exist. Certainly. There will be then, there will then be many masses, each of which appears to be one, but is not one, if one does not exist. Yes. And they will seem to possess number, if each seems to be one, and they are many. Certainly. And some will seem to be even, and others are. But all that will be unreal, but all that will be unreal, if the one does not exist. True. And there will, we assert, seem to be a smallest among them. But this proves to be many and great in comparison with each of the many minute fractions. Of course. And each mass will be considered equal to the many minute fractions. For it could not appear to pass from greater to smaller without seeming to enter that which is between them. Hence the appearance of equality. That is reasonable. And although it has a limit in relation to another mass, it has neither beginning nor limit nor middle in relation to itself. Why is that? Because whenever the mind conceives of any of these as belonging to the masses, another beginning appears before the beginning. Another end remains after the end. And in the middle are other more central middles than the middle, but smaller, because it is impossible to conceive of each one of them, since the one does not exist. Very true. So all beings which is conceived by any mind must, it seems to me, be broken up into minute fractions, or it would always be conceived as a mass devoid of one. Certainly. Now anything of that sort, if seen from a distance and dimly, must appear to be one. But if seen from close at hand and with keen vision, each apparent one must prove to be unlimited in number if it is really devoid of one, and one does not exist. Am I right? That is perfectly conclusive. Therefore, the other things must each and all appear to be unlimited and limited, and one and many. If the things other than the one exist, and one does not, Yes, they must. And will they not also appear to be like and unlike? Why? Well, just as things in a picture, when viewed from a distance, appear to be all in one, in the same condition and alike, but let's see. Just as things in a picture, when viewed from a distance, appear to be all in one, in the same condition and alike. Certainly. 
And when you come close to them, they appear to be many and different. And because of their difference in appearance, different in time, and unlike each other. Yes. And so the groups of the other things must appear to be like and unlike themselves and each other. Certainly. And also the same and different and in contact with one another and separated and in all kinds of motion and in every sort of rest and coming into being and perishing and neither of the two and all that sort of thing which we have easily mentioned in detail if the many exist and the one does not. Very true. Okay. Sounds like fractals instead of fractals. Back to the beginning, how does he proceed? Would you agree? He says, okay, let's take a look at this. What follows if we uh, take out the idea of one? Oh. Point is, can we still use our model and see what follows if we take out the one? The number of the parts could be A1. Right? Um, Continually adjusting our glasses. Mm -hmm. We're always adjusting our glasses. Well, often adjusting. Well, it looks, yeah, we're adjusting. Oh, look. <laughs> Appears. Appears. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <coughs> and a picture, distance, and yeah. close and uh, at a distance. Um, but, let's see. Oh, I, I was just suggesting that you'd have to erase the boundary. You'd have to erase the boundary. Everything would be scattered. Because? Because there's no one. Well, it can't be a whole. It can't be a whole. Mm -hmm. It can't be one. It'd be everywhere. Just, be, just kind of masses. Random. Stuff. Yeah, masses. Because as soon as you have a, a whole or a group, it has by parts. So it can't be even that. Yeah, it's even worse. Doing good, but isn't it interesting though that he preserves? It can still have the illusion of part, but it still could it be illusory. <laughs> so while he strictly speaking demolishes it, he then takes the next step and says, "You know what? It might appear to be one, and now you have it back." Only on the realm of mere appearance. appearance. Hmm. What does that mean? Hmm. Oh, what's he doing? Huh. Hmm. Well, let's go back into it before we raise that question. Hmm. Uh, just to go back to the appearance. Yeah, what makes the difference? What? Hmm. Would this be analogous to the shadows in the cave? Uh, excuse me. Would this be analogous to the shadows in the cave, the mind believing that what it sees, you know, is reality, as opposed to it's only being shadows? Yeah, but that, remember that shadows can be on two levels in reality, both in the cave and in the upper world, looking at the shadows and the reflections in the lake. But he does deal but with this still. on two levels, though. Oh, no. Okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying that image goes on two places. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, well, actually, we could go... Um, um, well, in one way of checking what you're saying, if we took the, the way he's describing, the way it seems, that could very likely be a description of shadows in the wall of cave. Mm. No, that's 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 uh, that's there. Let's see. Look here. Um, Let's go to that 
We're looking at the thing of the distance, shall we? At 165C, page 329. You say, look here, if you strip away the idea of the one, then what you're really looking at from the prior analysis that you're going to have a mass devoid of one. There goes the hole, there go through the parts, all that's gone. Now he shifts. Now anything of that sort, if seen from a distance and dimly, must appear to be one. But if seen from close at hand and with keen vision, each apparent one must prove to be unlimited in number. Oh. Oh. But if seen as a distance, then it's going to, the idea of one is now going to appear. So let's put, going to have the appearance of one. Uh, but by the way, if you get close, you know what you're going to see? It's unlimited. Hmm. Uh, ah. If it's really devoid of one, uh, the one doesn't exist. Therefore, the other things must each and all appear to be unlimited and limited and one and many if the things other than the one exists and the one does not. And will they not also appear to be like and unlike? Just when things in a picture when viewed from a distance appear to be all in one and in the same condition and alike. And you come close to them. They appear to be many and different because of their differences in appearance. So, look here. What is he doing here? So the point would be, why doesn't he stop? And why does he go on with the appearance? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Uh, would you agree I need an answer? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> I need one too. Well, Would this be related to Buddhism in any way? What would it be theological? Buddhism? Pardon? Buddhism? I didn't hear. Buddhism? Okay. More? I'm just thinking of the idea of causality and appearance. I, I That's there. Okay, look here. Um, <clears throat> this is saying that uh, there is a way in which four, the whole idea of four, can exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Only if you, only if you belong to a whole. The one that you're going to be using is not a pure, not a true one. Right. The others are other than the others, not other than one. No. Hmm. Hmm. That's 
is not easy to see because um, we did a lot with four. Would you agree it did look like metaphysically you could describe Christianity and Judaism and Islamic religion? Is mm -hmm. that appear to be the case? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that if we only take one half of eight, it looks like all of this could be demolished just by denying the one? Then you can't say there'll be parts, you can't say there's a whole, you can't say there'd be any like or unlike. That's the end of it. Our puzzle is, why does he go the next step? Or we could also ask it in the earlier part of four. Say in four, why did he need the transition of how a particular hunk, let's call it, of the many make the transition into the one. How significant was that for us? That's key to the whole thing. It's key to the whole proposition, that there is a transition, that there is uh, a becoming a part, a whole part, right? So that's and like some transformation critical part transformation. Of such a transition or conversion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, and strictly, did he need that? I, I think he did. He didn't need it in one sense, any more than he needs what we're doing now with eight. Put it in another way. Would you agree that two parts to four is two parts in eight? Hmm. Yes. Parts he... Uh, huh. They must balance each other. Well, the two parts of four, is strictly speaking, when he describes with great precision the idea of the one, whole, parts and the properties that belong to it. He could stop there. No, no. He takes the next part and talks about what would happen if, when, when there's a transition from the one to the other, from the unlimited to the other. Okay. Therefore, two parts. Would you agree in eight, we have something curious. We have two parts. Hmm. Let's call it... Uh, The denial of the one and the appearance of the one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So why do we, why, how come two parts? say more on the appearance of the one? Mm -hmm. Like, I understand the denial of the one, that the many exist and the one does not. But what what part, what do you mean by the appearance of the one? How he speaks of how the many appear as one, but upon closer reflection it will be seen to be an infinite multitude. Okay. Okay. Um. Could you pick it up at 165C and below, or in the... Thomas, if you have it, 165C. It appears to be one, not really. Now, anything of that sort, if seen from a distance and dimly, must appear to be one. But if seen close at hand and with keen vision, each apparent one must prove to be unlimited number if it's really devoid of one. Yeah. Okay. No. Um, it sounds like, uh, I'm thinking of how they're breaking up the atom. They break it up, get closer to it. Yeah, multiplying. No, that's true. What would you have to do with this? Like, put it together. Well, it seems it appears like one, but it isn't. Because as you get closer to it, it's many. So there isn't really any one. Well, it's like block letters where everything is written, printed out in block letters, and from a distance it would look like a block of uh, a design. But when you walk close, you can see each individual letter as an individual. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's no real boundary. Uh, is, uh, so the appearance is that uh, each letter is unto itself its own meaning unless relating to another one. 
first part, denial of the one. Wouldn't this be like relativism? Well, I don't know. I'll always agree with you, Jane. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> or what about existentialism? I don't know what that is. So. <laughs> I was thinking of Sartre's plays. So he's got the denial of the one in the first part. And then he's not denying it. He's saying, let us not talk about the same thing if it only has the appearance of one. Mm Contrasting it to four. Pardon? Like she said, if we're contrasting it to four, then whole. 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 A W H O L E. Oh. A whole. A black hole. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How about each? In four in four we used God. Oh, 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 okay, try that. Of God. Are we not working on the assumption that there are things that are bring people together, bind them into a one, call a religio, bring them together in a one, mm -hmm. and we can describe it in this way? Mm -hmm. So if you deny that idea of God, say mm -hmm. God doesn't exist, mm -hmm. now he's going the next step and saying, even if we grant that God has an appearance. appearance of being a one, mm -hmm. Oh, what does that add? Um, what about a marriage? I'm not against it. I have a friend of mine who was married. <laughs> well, there seems to be a binding together that gives the appearance of one. <laughs> <laughs> there goes your past marriage. That was good. Yeah, that was good. That was a good joke. I'm glad you like it. That's a new law. <laughs> okay, look here. Yeah, my favorite. Look here. Okay. So, um, so you can either can have the denial of the one as expressed in four, or even if you don't have a fully articulated or thorough understanding of the idea of one, and you only have the appearance of the one for your God or deity, we can still apply the same argument. But he's got a different argument, though. He's saying, you know what? You don't have a good idea of the one. Might look good in the distance. Hmm. Oh. Hmm. Is this a criticism? It won't really stand is? scrutiny, will it? Is that his point? Yes. Is this right. An undercutting of materialism? <laughs> oh, or is it materialism? <coughs> and Aristotle's children as naughty scientists? Oh. You see, we're going into. Uh, Five and nine, and that's why this is all. This is this point is important for five and nine as well. Mm. But right now, um, we go back. Let me ask you this one: Does this appearance of one from that section we were just reading? Does that give you the sense that he is addressing four more directly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If someone is reading the fourth hypothesis, and then they went into the latter part of Proposition 8, would the latter part of Proposition 8 seem to fit? in a much easier way to seeing similarities in the first part? Yeah. Uh, isn't that curious? Because 
The first part is only working with if one is not the denier. But by giving the idea of the appearance of one, he's saying, you know what? Take a good look at this, whether it's appearance or not, we're going to come up with our picture. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I'll tell you what we should do. Uh, Gina said she was willing to offer a six pack next Friday night for someone who can make clear of this and have its implications on five and nine. Well. And so I said that's okay, but only if Sean agrees. Done. <laughs> 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 so let's return to our beginning. Does it appear that we can say the dynamics of the groups that will find themselves together in this way can be expressed in a point hypothesis? Does it look like eight is the denial of it on two levels, both real and even that they only have the apparent unity? More oneness? Mm. Then what will five be? Denial of the appearance. Mm. Mm. Okay. okay. Mm. I mean, there aren't any other groups of thought that could be represented in five, could there? Oh, at five. Mm. Just wonder. Uh, oh, I know. Jump in. Nihilism. Who? Nihilism. Maybe nine. Why, why nihilism? Well, I was thinking it's got to be analogous to the third hypothesis, how the third hypothesis relates to the second one. Well, that's good. How the third relates to the second answer is why five is nihilism. Not five. One. Yeah, probably nine. Nine? Maybe, but five? I don't Which know. one are you talking about? Excuse five. Me. Yeah, five. <coughs> You're saying nine might be nihilism? No, I'm saying five, five. might be. I thought you said five, Jack. Yeah, I, that, that was right. Well, take a look because uh -huh. it's so short. That's what makes oh, yeah. so nice. Yeah, I'll participate. <laughs> By the way, it is a religion. It is a religion. Oh, okay. But tell, um, me, tell me which one. Five? Or, yeah, are you talking five or five? Number five, no. nothing in yeah. common. No parts, no whole, no nothing in common. I don't know. No part, no whole, no nothing. Mm -hmm. No unity, no hmm. oneness. No. I, I know what to do. Why don't we get something to read it? Yeah. Oh, good. Are you ready? Yes, yes, hold on, I'll turn the page. Go ahead. Let us then go back once more to the beginning and tell the consequences if the others exist and the one does not. Let us do so. Well, the others will not be one. Of course not. This is nine. Oh, sorry. Three, three, eleven. Three, also eleven. So you're reading Neil, you're saying. Are we going to read the jump there? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, sorry. Oh, it's five. Here's five. Do it again. Five. Please, I thought that was the first. Yeah, just jump off. Yeah. 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 One, 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 then what if we now drop these matters as evident and again consider whether, if one is, the things other than one are as we have said, and there is no alternative? Certainly. Let us then begin at the beginning and ask, if one is, what must happen to the things which are other than one? By all means. Must not the one be separate from the others? And the others from the one. Why is that? Because That's they're. Mm. Okay. What system are we on? Mm. Mm. Judaism. 
Oh, solipsism. No, no. Oh, I'm sorry. What's that word? Yeah, yeah, picture, God without a picture, picture it in your mind. Just picture it in your mind. Well, they have no contact. No contact. That was Christianity. <laughs> Transcendental. Not Obviously. <laughs> So you said you're Judaism? Judaism? No, I'm just saying it sounds like Freud's unconscious. I'm going to say just like, I'm just... Freud's unconscious. Can't ever get the record. But I don't know what religion... I'll, I will assume, therefore, that you're not advancing... No. Okay, I don't thank know. You. Thank you. Say it again. I don't know. Good. Let's read it again. Hold it, Julie Scotland. Well, what, it's the religion where the... Where there's no contact at all between the many and the and the one. Okay. Yeah, so. I don't remember which religion okay, has okay. that. Okay. Again. The one must be separate from the others. Must not the one be separate from the others and the others from the one? That's the... Well, if God is one. <laughs> Want to help Julie? Keep going. Go ahead. Because there's nothing else besides these, which is other than one and other than the others. Mm -hmm. For when we have said one and the others, we have included all things. Yeah. Well, then there's nothing other than these, in which both the one and the others may be. <laughs> Then the one and the others can never be in the same. They're always separate. Then they are separate. Yes. So one is transcended from the other. Ah, what's the word? Transcendent. Transcendent. Yeah. Is that Christianity? Right. This is transcendental. Transcendentalism, right? But there's no, yeah. no touching, no interaction between the two. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a theology that presupposes Transcend. a transcendent function. Hmm. Yeah, well, this, this goes. This goes. And whatever happens to this, there is no contact. No, no contact. Hmm. Now, see if that fits as we, we keep reading. All right. See. Okay, then um, then there's nothing other than these in which both the one and the others may be. No. Yeah. Then the one ahead, and Jill. the others can never be in the same. Apparently not. Then they are separate. Yes. And surely we say that what is truly one has no parts. How, How can it have parts? Then the one cannot be in the others as a whole. Right, therefore there's nothing. No impact of the divine on others. Right? Right. Can't participate. Mm -hmm. No participation. Um, nor can parts of it, if it is separate from the others and has no parts. Of course not. Then the others cannot partake of the one in any way. They can neither partake of any part of it nor of the whole. No, apparently not. The others are then not one in any sense, nor have they in themselves any unity. No. But neither are the others many. For if they were many, each of them would be one part of the whole. But actually, the things that are other than one are not many, nor a whole, nor parts, since they do not participate in the one in any way. Right. Neither are the others two or three, nor are two or three in them, if they are entirely deprived of unity. True. Nor are the others either themselves like and unlike the one, nor are likeness and unlikeness in them. For if they were like and unlike, or had likeness and unlikeness in them, the things which are other than the one would have in them two elements opposite to one another. Hmm, that's clear. 
but it is impossible for that to partake of two things which does not even partake of one. Impossible. The others are then not like nor unlike nor both. For if they were like or unlike, they would partake of one of the two elements. And if they were both, of the two opposites. And that was shown to be impossible. True. They are then neither the same nor other, nor in motion nor at rest, nor becoming nor being destroyed, nor greater nor less nor equal. And they experience no similar affections. For if the others are subject to such affections, they will participate in one and two and three and odd and even, in which we saw that they cannot participate if they are in every way utterly deprived of unity. Very true. Stop. Okay? Now look here. Take what follows for the rest of this paragraph and tell me to what it refers to. Okay, keep reading. Therefore, if one exists, the one is all things and nothing at all in relation both to itself and to all others. Hmm. To what does it refer? Wow. Major problem, okay? What, to what does it refer? Mm -hmm. Jump in, Julie. One. I, I don't know what to say. Okay, I'll go somewhere else. It seems to be a summary. Of what? Of all the, of what came before. Of all the other hypotheses. Okay. Well, it seems like it, seems it refers to all, some, few, what? Oh, you're talking... Two, three, four, and five? Three, four, and five? Two, three, four, and five. Two, three, four, and five. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Take a look. I'm not sure, but it's... It sounds like a, con it sounds like a summary. Yeah. If it is a conclusion that sweeps in its grasp two, three, four, and five, what do you think of that conclusion? It's a more impossible conclusion than the one after the first hypothesis. That's right. That's your conclusion. What? Yeah. Say it again. Say it again. I just said it's it's a more impossible. It's it's an impossible conclusion, and therefore, right? And therefore, all of those. All, it knocks out all of those. It knocks out two, three, four, five. Ah. Right. Hmm. Hey, by the way. Wow. Is it possible in the end he has a conclusion that includes six, seven, eight, nine, as well as two, three, four, five? Well, that'd be cool. <laughs> yes, it's possible. Then which is the only hypothesis? One. Oh, one. no. Then there's only one hypothesis. <laughs> mm, cool. Okay, let's go back over five and nine, because there's a lot more, I think, in five than we've seen, and it'd be fun to look at it. All right, next okay. one. And then we're out of it, then we have a party. Hey. Mm -hmm. And I think we may have had a benefactor. Someone left a six pack in the beer. Hey. I don't know who can run faster, but I'm ready to move.